welcome to the Sea of Green. I would first like to thank you for purchasing this tape with the express hope that it will be as educational and rewarding for you as it has been for us. The object of this tape is to demonstrate in easy to follow video form how you may in 90 quick days begin to grow as many of these lovely female buds as you wish. To maximize production and minimize time and space, they will be grown as 16 to 20 inch single stalk buds. We will take you through step by step from seed to clone to harvest. We work on a two week cloning cycle. Follow the simple instructions and soon you will begin your harvest. Once this happens, you will find like clockwork, once every two weeks, your harvest rolls in like a virtual sea of green wave after continuous wave, a self-perpetuating, endless supply of homegrown herb. Whether you decide to grow a closet-sized hobby or a trailer-sized factory, the process will be the same. Regardless of the size of your project, you will need some standard items and have some standard procedures to follow. This project is in a 50-foot long, 10-foot wide, 8-foot high trailer. Keeping your project on a need-to-know basis is a must. For that reason, we have allowed weeds to grow around the supposed main entrance. It gives the appearance of not being used. We then took off the windows and insulated them on the inside. On the outside, we covered the windows with sheet metals to include the door and then painted the entire trailer green to match the color of the barn that we have snuggled it up against over here. The heated or cooled air flows from this end of the trailer and exhausts from this end. Allow me to show you the exhaust duct. This large sheet metal duct allows for ample airflow and conceals the appearance of the exhaust fan. That doesn't look like an exhaust fan, does it? The real entrance to the trailer is a hole cut into the side of the barn which matches up with the back door of the trailer. It is covered by this piece of sheet metal which keeps out the rain and the snow. Let's take a look inside and see just how the project began. The trailer has been separated into two parts. The cloning room, which receives 18 hour of light daily, and this, the fruiting room, which receives 12 hours of light daily. This is our exhaust fan. It is thermostatically controlled and has a variable speed. This gives us the ability to control the amount of airflow through the trailer at all times. This fan is ample size for this room. Here on the left, we have two sets of tables. The tables on bottom are nailed to the floor and to the wall. The tables on the top would be placed on the floor to the right of the room. They all have wheels on their legs to facilitate their easy movement. This will allow easier access to the plants while working with them. We will see more of this in detail later. Over here we have the cloning room. All heating or cooling is done in the cloning room. The air is then conduited through this metal duct with the aid of a fan which is inside the duct and into the fruiting room. Let's take a look inside the cloning room. Besides housing the main electrical box and the main entrance, the cloning room is divided into four main sections. On the left, the pre-flowering table and the cloning table on the right, the areas for the mama and the three-layered cloning rack. This is our electrical box. We try to make our electricity as close to code as possible. This 400 watt metal halide rides on an eight foot moving rail which services this 10 foot by four foot pre-flowering table. The clones are placed on this table for two weeks growing to the height of 10 to 12 inches where they are then placed in the flowering room. 
The 400 watt light has a ballast hanging from the roof as all ballasts would be. They have their own outlet and timer as do the rails. An oscillating fan on the roof helps to keep a more even temperature in this room. This 400 watt metal halide and this eight foot moving rail service this eight foot by four foot area which will house our mamas. We will take 300 clones from the mamas each and every two weeks and place them on this three layered fluorescent grow lighted rack. The clones will stay on this rack for two weeks while they develop roots then be moved over to the pre-flowering table. This fan takes the heated and cooled air from the cloning room and sends it to the fruiting room. The fan has its own variable speed control. This wall holding the fan would be totally sealed, thus separating the cloning room from the fruiting room. The cloning room, which has an 18-hour light schedule, houses our mamas, develops our clones to root, and prepares them on the pre-flowering table till they are ready for the fruiting room. This door joins the two rooms. This is the back door of the trailer. We cut a hole in the barn to match it. This way our neighbors only see us go into the barn, never into the trailer. Watering the back of the trailer produces this nice camouflaging cover. This 5,000 watt generator is appropriate for auxiliary or main power supply. The seed. We will start with the seed. Given the proper environmental conditions, the seed will produce a plant similar to its parent. Select your seeds from only the best stock. Large, robust, dark, bold stripe, bulbous seeds seem to do the best. A hand lens helps us to find the best of the best among our collection. For our project, we use Afghani seeds. Some originated from seed stores overseas, while others were taken from really great buds we were lucky enough to find them in. First, we will have to germinate our seeds. I like to use a standard potting soil because it is usually more clean and free of bugs. The consistency should be such that when you compress the soil, it forms a nice solid, and yet when you press it lightly, it returns to its original form. To this approximately three gallons of potting soil, we will add approximately three gallons of coarse grain perlite. You will want to make sure you wear an appropriate breathing device and stay upwind if you are mixing soil inside. Exhaust the air through and out a window. The dust is not good to breathe. Be sure to mix the perlite and potting soil as thoroughly as possible. If you have an alternative soil mixture you prefer or would like to experiment with different mixtures, please feel free to do so. To this, we are going to add approximately one quart of fine ground pasteurized cow manure. This will give our young seedlings an additional food source. Since our soil mixture is more or less man-made, additional supplements will be required. The cow manure is then thoroughly mixed into the mixture. Here we are. To this, we will add two heaping tablespoons of horticultural hydrated lime. We want our pH to be between 6.5 and 7. The lime will help us to obtain a pH close to 7, which is neutral. If you have a problem with any aspect of this process, just keep trying and you will eventually succeed. And there you are. We are going to take these small plastic containers and fill them with the soil mixture. We will then demonstrate a few ways in which you may want to germinate your seeds. If you already have a favorite way you like to germinate your seeds, then feel free to do this. This will be a reoccurring theme we shall express throughout the video. We realize 
that not everyone has access to all the items we have for germinating, such as the felt type rooting cubes, the peat moss cups, the plastic containers or trays. Therefore, we will encourage you to find alternative items and methods that produce the same results. You will find that soda cans, Dixie cups, milk cartons, etc. are just as useful for this part of the process. Once planted, the seeds take only 7 to 10 days to germinate. The seeds are kept in the dark till they germinate. They are then placed under 18 hour fluorescent grow light and grow for approximately one week. Then their growing tip is pruned of approximately one quarter inch. They are allowed to grow another week and are transplanted into six inch plastic squares and placed on the pre-flowering table with 18 hour daily metal halide. They will remain on the pre-flowering table for two weeks where they will grow to the height of 10 to 12 inches and look like these plants in the background. Once the plastic containers are filled with soil, we will water them. We want to make sure that the soil is completely moist yet not overwatered. You'll want to check the moisture content of the soil a couple of times a day. In human atmosphere, this could mean watering once every few days. In an arid atmosphere, this could mean watering a couple of times a day. The soil should be kept moist at all times, but not soggy. If you notice any standing water in your tray, immediately pour it out. If the pH of your water or soil, for that matter, is too acidic, it may be adjusted with the horticultural hydrated line. If your water or soil is too alkaline, it can be adjusted with gypsum. We will discuss pH and the methods recommended for determining pH more in detail later in the film. We'll finish our watering up here, and there you are. Our trays are almost ready to be planted. We will be adding one more item to our water, however, and that is B1. B1 is a root stimulant and transplanting aid. The B1 is mixed with the water according to directions. It is watered into the soil, giving each small square a reasonable amount. We will be using B1 throughout our process. We will use it on our seeds, our transplants, and on our clones. At this stage, we're using it because of its ability to stimulate root formation and root growth. This is a very important part of the germination process as the seedling is mostly root when it first germinates. And there you are. We are now ready to plant our seeds. We would take an object such as this pencil and make a small, approximately one half inch deep hole into the center of each square. Be sure your holes are no deeper than this. We will now place one seed into each of the individual holes. Try to make sure the seeds go to the bottom of the hole. Lightly press the soil around the top of the hole and make sure that your seed is sufficiently covered with soil. Continue this until all the holes have been planted and all the seeds have been covered. The seedlings will be covered and placed on the cloning table under 40 watt, four foot long fluorescent grow tubes. These grow tubes fit standard shop light fixtures. Once sprouted, I keep the grow tubes about two or three inches above the tops of the plants. The temperature of the soil should be kept as close to 80 degrees as possible. You may purchase small heating pads which are made to heat your trays from the bottom. You also want to make sure the seedlings have a proper exchange of air. We will discuss the air exchange more in detail. You will then want to cover the seeds with something that gives them a greenhouse type setting. Here we have our felt type rooting cubes. They are excellent for germinating seeds. We have our B1, water, our seeds, some instruments, and a notebook to help us remember our schedule. We are going to take our measuring device and measure an appropriate amount of B1. That's B1. You will notice in just a few seconds that the B1 
is a rather thick liquid. We will take the measured amount, measured amount, and add it to the water. You will then want to make sure that you stir the B1 thoroughly in the water. As you can see, that is just what I'm doing now. The B1 will sit at the bottom in a puddle if you don't mix it thoroughly. And there we are. I think that should do it. We will now pour the water onto the rooting cubes. You will notice that the rooting cubes are quite porous. The water does not spread around. It is soaked up immediately by the cubes. For this reason, we will have to put almost a gallon and a half of water in and on the cubes to get them completely soaked. I like to keep at least one half inch of standing water in the trays to help keep the seedlings always moist. The standing water must be exchanged every 48 hours. I like to keep a written record of all my procedures as it helps to me to remember what seeds are planted on what day or which batch of clones was cloned on what day. As we proceed through the project, there will be a number of different things going on at the same time. Keeping certain records will help you to keep the schedule more accurate. You will notice that I'm adding additional water to the tray. This will assure me that I have my required one half inch of standing water, which will keep my seedlings moist. That's one half inch. I will now take my seeds and put one seed into each separate square. These seeds will then be covered and placed on a three-layered fluorescent grow-lighted cloning rack. Like the other seeds we germinated, they will spend their first week or so without light. After you notice the seeds are beginning to sprout, they will be taken and transplanted to larger containers and put under 18 hour of fluorescent grow light. After about a week, the seedlings will have grown a few inches, developed some foliage, and started to develop some nice roots. At this time, the top one quarter inch of the terminal bud is pruned, and then the plant is grown for another week or so under the fluorescent grow lights. It is then transplanted into a six inch square and moved over to the pre-flowering table where it will begin an 18 hour a day light schedule a 400 watt metal halide. After about 14 days, they will have grown to the height of 10 to 12 inches and be ready to be sexed. I'm going to add just a little more water to this tray to be sure that I have enough to include my one half inch of standing water. Here we are about 10 days after we planted the seeds in the root cubes. The seeds have germinated and are ready to go into larger containers. The seedlings will be placed in the squares, almost to the bottom, but not quite. Here I am taking the seedlings and putting them into the standard soil mixture. I simply put it into a hole I made in the soil, press the soil gently around the stem, and do as many this way as I can. Whichever way you germinate your seeds, if you must handle them, be sure to do so as carefully as possible. The root hairs which are now forming are quite fragile and you will want to do as little damage to them as possible. There we are, and lightly press around the side. These squares are filled halfway with soil and will have the root cubes placed directly on top of them. Some of the seedlings have grown their roots into the root cubes themselves. I will separate the cubes with this knife. The cubes slice easily and make nice single seeded units. The cubes are my favorite for germinating seeds and seem to give me the best results. I will now place one cube into each square sitting on the soil of the half filled container. I will then add more soil until the cubes are just barely covered on some and others I would just sit on top of the soil. We, we will encourage you to experiment with the different aspects of the growing processes as we go along. 
Realizing not everyone has access to all the same equipment, this will also be a reoccurring theme throughout the film. We will water the seedlings thoroughly and place them on the cloning rack where they will begin their 18 hour a day light cycle. Then we place them under the fluorescent lights. Seedlings sprouted in root cubes may also be transplanted into these small peat moss cups. Dixie type cups, cans, etc. could be used in place of peat moss cups. Peat moss cups are excellent for starting your seedlings in also. Simply add soil, press lightly, and there it is. Doesn't that look nice? I like to transplant seedlings into these peat moss cups because when it comes time to transplant them into the six inch containers, the roots are not disturbed at all. The peat cup is planted directly into the six inch container. This is important because at that stage of growth, the roots have developed extensive secondary root system and you don't want to damage them. You will notice we keep everything in small plastic trays. This helps us to control the water in that every seedling in the tray has the same amount of water at any given time. It also makes it easier to move the seedlings from place to place. The peat cups soak up water when watered and hold the water quite well considering how porous they are. The fact that they are porous allows them to breathe, so to speak, and helps to bring more oxygen to the roots. Because the peat cups hold the water so well, I do not allow any standing water in the tray as with the root cubes by themselves. Any excess water in these trays should be poured out immediately. Once these seedlings have been transplanted to the peat cups, they, like the other seedlings, will be placed on the cloning rack and begin their 18 hour a day light period. They will remain there for approximately two weeks, during which time they will be pruned, develop foliage, roots, and grow to the height of six to eight inches. After these two weeks, they will be put on the pre-flowering table for two more weeks, this time under the metal halide, 18 hours a day. They will then reach the height of 10 to 12 inches and be ready for our special process which determines sex. We have found that it is not necessary to reduce the life period of the young seedlings in order to determine their sex. If you reduce the life period, it not only stunts their growth, but is a waste of time also. We will explain and show you this process more in detail as we go on. We will only be doing seeds once. With the seeds we germinate this time, we will determine their sexes, throw away all the males, with the exception of keeping your best for any seed production you might want to do later, and raise us a stock of female plants. This stock of female plants will be used once every two weeks to make 300 clones, and all future plants will be created by making clones. There's another nice seedling, and another. Don't they look nice? Just add a little bit of soil, press, and there you are. After being on the cloning rack for two weeks, the young seedlings will look like this. These seedlings are doing quite well under the 18 hour a day light schedule. As you can see, they have developed nice leaf growth. They appear to be rather squat, and this is because we prune them when they were about 10 days old. We placed small plastic markers in the peat cups. This tells us which seeds come from where. Your seedlings must be checked a few times each day to make sure they are all right. And I think these look all right. These seedlings were grown in root cubes. You can see their nice root systems and luxuriant foliage. They are now ready to be planted into six inch squares like those in the background. Seedlings on the left were raised in peat moss cups and are ready to be planted in the six inch squares also. What we have here is a sufficient amount of six by six inch squares 
which we will transplant our seedlings into. Next to that, we have a standard soil mixture. We have saved only the best of our seedlings. This means that over half of them were thrown away, and the ones you see here are only the best of the best. Some seeds simply do not do as well as others. Only these few are good enough to become mamas. And these look very nice. Okay, now let's plant a few of these into the six inch squares, just like we've done these right here. Simply take your six inch square and fill it almost full with the standard soil mixture. Then take your seedling and putting your fingers over the top, turn it over and give it a gentle shake like this. Then carefully flip it over into the waiting container. Press firmly but gently around the base of the stem and then add a little bit of soil. Level, brush it off, and there you are. Once we have transplanted all of these, we will leave them here on the pre-flowering table for 10 to 14 days. During that time, they will grow to the height of 10 to 12 inches. Marijuana is photoperiodic. That means if you give marijuana 18 hours of light daily, it will stay in the vegetative state indefinitely. If you drop the light period down to 12 hours a day, it will simulate the time in fall when the plants would naturally go to seed. They will enter the fruiting state. If we do this to our seedlings, we will waste about six weeks and stunt our plants. What we will do instead is we will clone, that is prune the top three inches of the plant. We will take the top three inch tip, it is called a clone now, we will take the top clone and place it into a rooting cube. We will take one clone from each parent seedling. We will tag each clone with a number so we will know which plant it came from. After the parent plant has been cloned, it is placed back under the metal halide to continue its uninterrupted growth. The clone is placed under the fluorescent grow lights on the cloning rack. The light period is then dropped down to 12 hours a day. Because of the photo period of marijuana, the clone has now received its genetic message to go to seed. After two weeks on the cloning rack, the clones will start to show gender. In the meantime, the parent seedling would have been under the 400 watt metal halide for 18 hours a day and would have grown considerably. But let's not get too far ahead. Here the young seedlings are two weeks after they were first put into the six inch squares. They have been growing nicely and have reached the height of about 10 or 12 inches under the 400 watt 18 hour daily light period. The 400 watt metal halide is ample light for this stage of growth. The area we are growing in is 10 foot long and about 4 foot wide. The plants are checked a couple of times a day for moisture, temperature, and general observation. I like to keep the temperature around 76 to 80 degrees. The plants usually only need to be watered once every few days. I like to give them about a quarter cup each day, then every few days when they really start getting dry, I give them a good watering. This moving rail is six foot long. It covers an eight foot long by four foot wide area easily. The motor device goes both ways. It goes to one end and touches a stop, like this right here, which indicates to it to go back the other way. I have simply used a two by two inch board and a couple of pieces of chain to hang the light to the rail. You must make certain that the cord hanging from your light and from your rail are completely out of the way of all the moving parts of the light setup. You can see how the wires are hung from the roof. It may look like a mess, 
but the wires are where they are supposed to be. The wooden racks that these plants are on are covered with a thick plastic sheeting. This is absolutely necessary because of all the spillage and overflow caused by watering. You will notice that we are still using the white plastic markers which indicate which plant come from which seeds. Now let's do some cloning. The node of a plant is the place on the stem of the plant where the leaf, the lateral branch, and the leaf spur form an axis. See where the new growth on the stem is beginning? That is a node. This plant has about five major nodes on it. This one next to it has about the same amount. We will prune the top three inches and that will still leave us a few nodes left on the main stem. And on the nodes left on the stem is where our new vegetative growth will come from. Here are some more nodes. The top of the plant, the leaf, this is a node, this is a node with, that's a node. You can see the nice growth starting to come out of the nodes. Once we cut the top of the plant, then the little vegetative growth you see coming from these nodes will take right off. We're going to make our cut below this node, right here, about right there, and directly above that node right there. We'll be making a 45 degree angle cut just about right there, right above that node. Here we are, sharp razor blade, 45 degree angle cut, and we now have a clone. Here we are at the pre-flowering table and cloning table. As you can see, I like to keep the metal halide about 20 inches from the tops of the growing plants. This of course means that you must periodically raise the lights as the plants grow. We will be making another selection at this time. We will clone only the best half of these seedlings here. We will take about 200 clones. About half of them will be males, which will of course give us about 100 female plants. Of these, only about 16 of the very best will remain to become our stock of mamas. These seedlings are quite healthy and look really beautiful. The ones I don't want to use will be given to friends. Now, let's really do some cloning. You will need a few standard items. You will need a sharp blade, some stickers like these, and some type of rooting medium to place the clones in. This time we will, we will be using root cubes. However, we will be using other mediums later. The first thing we're going to do is to water the root cubes thoroughly. As you will remember, they are quite porous and soak up a tremendous amount of water. We will be adding over a gallon of water to make sure we have our required one half inch of standing water in the bottom of the tray. The one half inch of standing water must be exchanged every 24 hours. You will also want to be sure to check your water level each day and make sure you have your one inch of standing water at all times. And you can see the standing water right there. Okay. And there we are. Now, let's take our first bunch of clones and clone them. Here, as you can see, we have taken four seedlings and planted them directly into the six inch square. We did so, so that we can conserve space. You will notice that each of these plants has about four major nodes along the main stem. we will be taking our clones from the top three inches of the plant, which will leave three major nodes below each cut. These major nodes will be the spots where new vegetative growth will begin. We will take these stickers and on them indicate square one, 
plant A, B, C, or D. Then we will take the sticker and put it on the six inch square, which is square one. That tells us that this is square number one, and it also tells us which plant is A, which plant is B, which is C, and which is D. Next, we will put a similar sticker on the tray, left to right, one, two, three, up and down, A, B, C. Then we will know which clone belongs to which plant. When we take our clone, we go about three inches down and cut directly above the next node on the stem. We then take the clone and dip it into an antifungal rooting powder, gel, or liquid, in this case a powder. We then place the clone into the root cube, making sure it goes almost to the bottom of the root cube. The tip of the stem of the clone must be submerged in the one half inch of water or it will die. Now we will take clone B, three nodes up, and make a cut. Again, we will dip it into the rooting powder, there we are, and place it into the cube. We want to make sure it's seated properly in the one half inch of water. You will notice that we will be using every other space in order to give each clone sufficient room. We will now take clone C, go three nodes up, and make the cut. Following the same procedure, dip the clone in the antifungal rooting powder and place it most of the way into the root cube. There we are. I have to make a little adjustment on this one over here. We will now take our final clone from square number one. Three nodes up, make a cut, and then of course into the antifungal rooting powder and gently into the cube. And there we have our first row. I like to add a little bit of water directly to the clones after I finish each of my rows. And there we are. I will now place the sticker on the tray indicating which square these clones are from and which clone is from which plant. I place the sticker directly in front of the row that I have cloned. We will put this square back on the pre-flowering table. We like to put the larger plants on the outside of the table and the smaller plants to the inside. This allows more proper distribution of the light as the rail carries the light across the table. Let's find one of the larger seedlings down here in the center and clone them next. Oh, here's a real nice one. Okay, sit it there. And then we will count one, two, three nodes up and make the cut at a 45 degree angle with your razor blade. And then dip it to the cloning powder and place the clone gently in the root cube. That's a nice one. Making sure it goes into the half inch of water. The stem, the tip of the stem must be down in the half inch of water. We will continue this process until we have cloned at least 200 seedlings. As each trayful is cloned, they will be placed under the fluorescent grow lights where they will receive 12 hours, that's 12 hours of daily light. They will stay there for two weeks, at which time most of them will begin to show gender. Remember, they are photoperiodic and will show gender if they receive a reduced light period of only 12 hours of light per day. Once we determine the sex of our clones, we will look at the stickers on them and determine which clone came from which parent seedling. 
By doing this, we will be able to determine which of our seedlings are male and which are female. We will then take all the male seedlings and male clones and throw them away. You will want to keep all the female seedlings and throw away all the female clones, as we have no need for them. We will now place the clones on the fluorescent lighted cloning rack. They will stay here two weeks. By the end of two weeks, most of the clones will be showing gender. Here we are two weeks later. The clones have grown a few inches, developed luxuriant leaf growth, and even some roots. Let's take a closer look because they have developed gender also. These are male plants. The staminate primordia and the calyx, the floral sheath, readily identify these as male plants. This staminate flower is where the pollen is housed. If your clone looks like this, it is a male. We have allowed these males to mature a little so you can get a better idea of what they look like. These staminate calyx would have already released their pollen from their stamens. What we have here is a hermaphrodite. A hermaphrodite is a plant of both male and female gender. If any of your clones now or later on in the process look like this, you should pull them immediately. They will produce pollen, which will inhibit the growth of your clones later on. Here you can see both staminate male and pistillate female indicators. If you want to collect pollen, take a flowering male, put its head into a plastic bag, and shake vigorously. And there you have future generations of many many seeds. Next, we will look at a female plant. This is a female plant. It is easily identified by its many long white pistils protruding from their pistillate calyx. If any of your clones look like this, keep the parent seedlings and discard the clone. At this point, we have discarded all of our males and have nothing but females left. As you remember, when we cloned the parent seedling, we put the seedling back under the metal halide and they have been growing ever since. Continue to grow these under their 18 hour a day, 400 watt metal halide schedule until they reach this, the height of approximately three foot. We call these females our stock of mamas. The wooden rack they are sitting on is layered with thick clear plastic. The spillage and the overflow of the water during watering on the plastic acts as a reservoir for the plants. This helps to assure us that all the roots will stay moist. Once the young mamas have reached this height, they are capable of producing 15 to 20 clones each. It will take about 20 plants this size to produce the 300 clones we will require every two weeks. We have approximately 80 mamas here and we will be keeping only the best of the best. And I can tell you that will be a hard decision to make which ones stay and which ones go. Once we have taken the first cloning from these plants, they will rejuvenate under the metal halide 18 hour a day light schedule for two weeks until they are ready to clone again. Don't these future clones look really nice? When they are ready for their second cloning, you will notice they have grown larger. They will also have more tops with which you may take clones from. When the mamas reach the size that they are producing about 25 clones apiece, I have found that 15 of them fit into the space allocated for the mamas quite well and give me 300 clones I require every two weeks. I like to fertilize at least once every three weeks. If it has been three weeks since your plants have been fertilized, then now would be a good time to fertilize them again. Be sure to use the high nitrogen full spectrum fertilizer, which we will be discussing a little bit more in detail as we get on into the film. Looking closely, you can see this plant was cloned two weeks ago. 
right here is where the top was cloned and is now ready to produce many future clones. From this day on, the cloning room will be on an 18 hour a day light schedule. Whether it is this three layered fluorescent grow lighted cloning rack or the 400 watt metal halide lighted pre-flowering table here or the 400 watt metal halided area for the mamas which is right here. This is our cloning table. In the winter time I find that it is best for us to heat with propane. If you are not using a building outside you perhaps will not have that problem. This cloning room is ready to produce our first 300 clones. Each 400 watt light and each rail has its own timer and its own outlet. This indoor thermometer tells me the temperature of the room on the floor down here where the mamas are and also at head level. This 400 watt metal halide is sufficient light for the four by eight foot area that the mamas are in. A six foot moving rail system is perfect for this eight foot area of mamas. As a general rule of thumb, I like to keep the bottoms of the lights 18 inches from the tops of the plants. Let's clone our first 300 clones. Remember, for cloning, we will need an antifungal cloning liquid powder or gel. In this case, it's a gel. We will also need some type of cutting device, such as an X-Acto knife or like this razor blade, and a punch for the soil. Whenever we put our clones in the standard soil mixture, I like to pre-punch holes in the soil so the tips of the clones are not damaged. The clones should be put almost to the bottom of the soil, but not to the bottom. We will take the top three inches of the growing terminal and then directly above the node make a 45 degree angle cut. The clone will then be dipped into the gel and a thin film of gel will adhere to the stem and you can see that right there. Gently plant the clone into the soil and press lightly on the soil to secure it in place. This is a standard soil mixture. We will now take another clone in the same fashion, cut right above the node, dip into the antifungal gel, and then again place it gently but firmly into the pre-made hole into the soil. We will continue to clone until we have 300 clones. As each tray of clones is finished, it will be put on the cloning rack under 18 hours daily fluorescent grow light. The clones will stay there for two weeks. At the end of the two weeks, they will have developed nice root systems, grown a few inches, and developed luxuriant foliage. After two weeks on the cloning rack, the clones will be ready to be moved to the pre-flowering table. The day that you do this, the cloning rack will be empty. You will therefore need to clone 300 more clones to fill up the cloning rack. As you move them to the pre-flowering table, you will also want to transplant them into the six inch squares like the one we used earlier. We use the same standard soil mixture in the six inch squares as we are using with these clones here. Since the pre-flowering table only holds 210 of the six inch squares, we will be using only the best 210 of these clones to go onto the pre-flowering table. Once these clones have been placed on the pre-flowering table, 
they will remain there for approximately 14 days. They will be receiving 18 hours of 400 watt metal halide every day. We like to use metal halide during the vegetative state because the spectrum of the metal halide is more suitable for vegetative growth. I like to keep the bottom of the light approximately 18 inches from the tops of the plants. This will mean that you have to make periodic adjustments on your light as your plants grow. These plants will not need to be fertilized while they are on the pre-flowering table. They will remain at a temperature of 76 to 80 degrees Fahrenheit because that is the temperature you try to maintain in the cloning room. I try to never let the temperature in the cloning room or fruiting room get above 80 degrees at the level of the plants. Sometimes the temperature near the roof will be much warmer. This is why an oscillating fan attached to the ceiling and pointing downward is such a good idea. As for it will blow the hot air downward and make for a more even distribution of air throughout the room. You must also make sure that during the winter time your temperature does not drop more than 10 degrees below your daily average. At night when your lights are out is the time you will most likely have to be aware of this temperature change. During the 14 days the clones are on the pre-flowering table, they will grow to an approximate height of 10 to 12 inches. They will develop rich and sumptuous growth and an intricate root system. As you remember, the first day we moved the clones to the pre-flowering table, we also cloned our mamas again and filled our cloning rack with 300 new clones. We will then take the clones from the pre-flowering table and move them into the fruiting room where there they will begin their 12 hour a day light period under the 400 watt high pressure sodium lights. The day we move them into the flowering room we will take the second set of clones we made and move them to the pre-flowering table. They will of course be put into the six inch squares just like the others were. This means that the cloning rack will be empty. Therefore, we will clone our mamas again and fill the cloning rack up. You will now have your cloning rack filled with clones, your pre-flowering table filled with clones, and you will be moving the first set of clones you did into the fruiting room. The fruiting area of our room is 36 foot long by 10 foot wide. Only 8 foot of the width is used for fruiting because 2 of the 10 foot are used for a walkway. I've divided the fruiting room length into 6 individual sections. Each of these 6 foot sections holds approximately 210 clones in their 6 inch squares. We have now filled up 1 sixth of the fruiting room. We will now wait for another 14 days to pass and then we will clone again. The first day of cloning filled the cloning rack. The next time we cloned was the 14th day of cloning because we waited two weeks before we cloned our second time. The third time we cloned was the 28th day of cloning. That means the fourth time you clone will be the 42nd day. Remember now, every 14 days from this time on, plants will be moved to the pre-flowering table, to the fruiting room, from the cloning rack to the pre-flowering table, and the mamas will be cloned once again to fill up the cloning rack. So on your 56th day, you will do your fifth cloning. This is also the same time the third group of clones you did on the 28th day of cloning will be put into the flowering room. You will continue the schedule and on the 70th day you will make your 6th cloning, on the 84th day you will make your 7th cloning, and on the 98th day you will do your 8th cloning. The day you do your 8th cloning will also be the day you move your 6th set of clones onto the pre-flowering table. Since we have divided the fruiting room into six sections, 
This means that the entire fruiting room is now filled. The next cloning that you will make, which will be your ninth cloning, will be done two weeks later on the 112th day. You're probably saying to yourself, wait a minute, didn't he just say the entire room was filled up? Well, if you clone 300 more clones, then where the heck is he going to put them? As you will remember, the 28th day of cloning, you filled up the first one-sixth of the fruiting room. That one-sixth has been maturing for 84 days and is now ready to harvest, vacating a space which may now be filled with the next group of clones from the pre-flowering table. From this time on, you will harvest one-sixth of your room every two weeks as you do your cloning. We're about ready to finish up our first 300 here. Slice, dip into the cloning gel, slide film onto the stem, and then press gently. These clones are looking real nice. We like to water each row right after we finish the row because I like to be sure, even though I've pushed the stems of the clones down into the soil, and I'm, I think the tip of the clone is into the water, I find that watering the row right after I've cloned the row assures me that the clones will have moisture down at their tip and they won't get an air bubble in them. The stem of this clone had to be trimmed just a little bit. There was a leaf there, I cut it off, and now I have a nice long stem. There we are. have to make sure it's down into the soil. Take one more clone, cut, dip, and plant. That's pretty easy to do. And as you can see, none of these clones are wilting or drooping. And that's indicative of the fact that they are into the one half inch of water. Another one, that looks nice. You can see how rapidly I'm moving through the cloning here. And as you will discover, as this process continues, cloning is a very easy and simple thing to do. We have one more row here, and we will have finished our cloning. Make sure to pre-punch your hole. The tips of these clones are quite fragile. If you don't, pre-punch your hole, then you're liable to tear up and damage the tip of the clone. Here's a real nice clone on the top. We'll take that, cut a 45 degree angle, dip into the cloning liquid gel or powder, in this case a gel, and plant. I think we have about one more clone here. And there we are. We will place these clones onto the cloning rack where they will stay for two weeks. They will receive 18 hours a day 40 watt fluorescent grow light. We will make sure all the environmental factors are attended to such as temperature, water, and so on. After the clones have been on the cloning rack for two weeks, they will look something like this. They will have developed nice roots, nice leaf growth, grown a few inches, and will be ready to move to the pre-flowering table as you prepare for your second cloning. Two weeks have passed since we cloned our first 300, now we're ready 
to do our second cloning. The first clones, as you just saw, were ready to be moved to the pre-flowering table. This will give us room on the cloning table for these clones right here. The cloning process is always about the same. However, this time, we will be using slightly larger plastic squares. We will fill them with the standard soil mixture, which as you recall, was a mixture of three gallons potting soil, three gallons per light, mixed with one quart of fine ground pasteurized cow manure and two heaping tablespoons of horticultural hydrated lime. We're now going to water each of our plastic squares with our B1, the transplanting aid. As we water our plastic squares thoroughly, we will need to also remember to water them enough so we will be sure to have our required one half inch of standing water in the bottom of the tray. Make sure each one is watered thoroughly. And there we are. The tip of the clone should only go almost all the way to the bottom of the soil, but not all the way. Leave a little bit, like a quarter inch, from the bottom, which is best. I like to use these single edge razor blades because I cut myself with them less. If you remember, a couple of weeks ago, when we cloned these mamas for the first time, we cut them down pretty much to the nubs. Notice how much they have rejuvenated themselves in the two weeks. The stems of the tips are much thicker now, about an inch to the right of this clone is where the previous clone was taken. This time you will notice that we are not using the antifungal liquid gel or powder. Isn't that a pretty clone? Some people feel that they are absolutely necessary, so I encourage you to experiment with and without it. You will also notice that the clones I am taking now are a little bit longer than the clones that we were taking before. See the nice long stem on this one? The clones that we are taking now are about four to five inches long. This gives us a nice long stem to put into the soil. Trim that one just a little bit. Now we do have a nice long stem. Okay. Press that into the soil and press lightly around the clone on the soil to hold the clone in place. I like to add a little bit of water to each of the clones after I put them in the soil. As you can see, most of the stems are rather thick on the second cutting. This will also give me about a five inch clone that will go nicely into the soil. Please remember to make a hole for the clone so you don't damage the tip of the clone. And again, I like to add a little water to the plant after cloning. And there we are. That's a pretty clone also. Remember, there was one half inch of water in the tray when we started cloning. It has been suggested that clones taken near the base of the plant would develop faster than those taken from the top of the plant, like this one here. Although it has been my experience that clones taken from the top do just as well as those taken from the bottom of the plants. The half inch of standing water in this tray must be changed every 24 hours. This will make sure that the young clones have an adequate and fresh supply of clean, oxygenated water at all times. A little watering there. You will want to make sure that the tip of the clone is down far enough 
so that it is in the half inch of clean standing water. Please bear with me while I continue to emphasize that. Here we have another nice clone taken from the top of the plant. As you can see, it has a very nice thick stem. And now we will place it into the soil. Sometimes in the winter, the water will be rather cold coming from your faucet. So make sure the water is at room temperature. The plants don't like it if the water is cold. Notice the fat, wide leaves. That is indicative of an Afghani strain. Sometimes the stem of the clone has to be pruned in order to make it the correct length to be planted. As you can see, we have pruned this plant until it was quite sparse. Two weeks from now, it will be a lush bush again. But next time, it will be a little larger. Under the right environmental conditions, these plants can grow as much as one foot in two weeks. You will notice when we take our cuttings, we place them immediately into the soil and water. It takes only a second longer when you are using a rooting medium. If too much time is taken between the cut and the planting, an embolism or air bubble might get into the stem. That will prevent transpiration of water into the stem and may kill the clone. These 300 clones will now go on the cloning rack and begin their two week stay under the fluorescent grow lights just as soon as we finish our very last clone. Trim it just a little bit and then into the soil. Cut, trim, trim again, and into the pre-punched hole, into the soil. There you are. And you know me, Hans, I'm going to add a little more water. Well, two more weeks have passed, and here are those clones that you just saw as clone. They have developed nice root systems, luxuriant foliage, and are ready to be transplanted into the six inch squares that will be placed on the pre-flowering table. And since two more weeks have gone by, we are now ready to do our third cloning. You will notice this time, we are using felt-type rooting cubes for our clones. See how these cubes soak up the water? It will take approximately a gallon and one half of water into the tray. As you can see, the first gallon was not enough, and I must add even more if I am to obtain my one half inch of standing water that I I require. Okay, there. I think that should just about do it. Empty that container. Okay, perfect. Now, oh, look here. You will notice we have a little visitor here, a ladybug. Ladybugs and other predatory insects may be mail ordered and introduced into your project. I have found that these insects have been quite beneficial to the crop. My favorite is ladybugs. You may order them by the quart or by the gallon. That's what we call a good bug. A good bug. These felt type rooting cubes have pre-prepared holes. The holes are this deep right here. I, however, like my holes just a little bit deeper, like this, so that the tip of the clone goes almost 
to the bottom of the root cube, like that. See? Okay. We have a nice clone, about four inches long, to start the third cloning with. We will place these clones into the root cubes. And remember to skip every other space so that they will have enough room to grow. You will also notice that our mamas are getting larger and larger as we progress. This will continue until the plants get about five foot tall. Then I will keep them to that height. Some people like their clones to be about six, seven, or eight inches in length. I prefer my clones to be anywhere from four to six inches in length. There is a real nice one right there to go into my corner. And there we are. I personally have had a much better survival rate with the smaller clones. Clones from the very bottom of the plant, which have stopped their lateral growth, such as this one down here, seem to root quite well, however. Now, into the cube we go. Into the cube we go. Be sure it's all the way in. This door in the partition which divides the cloning room from the fruiting room may only be used when the two rooms are on an equal light schedule. The fruiting room is on a 12 hour a day light schedule. The cloning room is on an 18 hour a day light schedule. There is of course six hours of lighting difference. If the door is open during those six hours, light will get into the fruiting room. When the lights are off in the fruiting room, the room is totally sealed and no light is allowed to enter. If you should get light into the fruiting room, you will ruin your light schedule. The main reason that we have timers on our lights and rails is so that the lights may be turned on and off at exactly the same time each day. If you do not follow, this exact schedule, and if you allow light to enter the fruiting room when it is not supposed to, your buds will not mature properly and your harvest will be drastically reduced. I have my light schedule set up so that my fruiting room and my cloning room both automatically come on at 6 a.m. The fruiting room is turned off exactly 12 hours later at 6 p.m. by the electrical timer. The cloning room stays on for six more hours as it is on the 18 hour a day light schedule and turns itself off at midnight. I do not use the door joining the two rooms between the hours of 6 p.m. and midnight. After these 300 clones are cloned, they will be placed on the cloning rack. The clones on the cloning rack will then be moved over to the pre-flowering table. The clones on the pre-flowering table are now ready to be moved into the flowering room. And into the root cube nicely. And there we are. 45 degree angle cut, nice stem, there we are. The cloning we just did was in root cubes and they are my favorite medium for cloning. With the third cloning done, these clones here from the second cloning are now ready to be transplanted into the six inch squares here on the pre-flowering table. These 10 to 12 inch clones from the first cloning are ready for the fruiting room. I have made this diagram to help us more easily understand the transition we're going through now.
that we have done our third cloning. Once we have finished the third cloning, we will begin using the fruiting room as well as the cloning room. So follow along for a moment and I will try to explain as precisely as I can the rest of the project. Our project requires two basic areas. We have the fruiting room and the cloning area, which is right here. As you will remember, these areas are separated by plastic wall right here. All of the lights in the cloning area are on an 18-hour daily schedule. All of the lights in the fruiting area are on a 12-hour light schedule. As you will recall, in the cloning room, we have already done two clonings. The first cloning is on the pre-flowering table here. The second cloning is on the cloning rack. The first cloning was done on the first day of cloning, and the second cloning was done on the 14th day of cloning. Now we will wait for 14 more days, and then we will do our third cloning on the 28th day. Now on the 28th day, the clones here on the pre-flowering table that have been growing under the metal halide for 18 hours a day have grown to the height of 10 to 12 inches. The clones that were done on the 14th day have been sitting on the cloning rack under the fluorescent lights for 18 hours a day, are now ready to go over here to the pre-flowering table. So this is a milestone in our project. And what we will do is to take another cloning, but in order for us to make this rack clear for another cloning, we will have to take these off the pre-flowering table in the cloning room and put them into one-sixth of a section in the fruiting room. Remember, we only take the best 210 clones over to the pre-flowering table. Then we take 210 clones that were on the pre-flowering table and move them to one-sixth of the fruiting room, where they will receive 12 hours a day of high-pressure sodium. This is a path and steps that we will follow once every 14 days. It will be a 14-day step. During that time, the clones will go from here to here. These clones will go to here, and the clones will fill up one-sixth of the fruiting room. The reason we divided the fruiting room into six sections of, is, of course, each section represents two weeks. It takes 12 weeks from the time the plant leaves a pre-flowering table and goes into here. 12 weeks later, it has reached maturity. So now, on the 42nd day of cloning, if we clone 300 clones again and put them on the cloning rack and then move the best 210 over here, take these 210, fill up the second section of the fruiting room, then 14 days later, on the 56th day, the third section will be filled up. And then on the 70th day, the fourth section will be filled up. On the 84th day, the fifth section will be filled up. On the 98th day, the sixth section will be filled up. On the 112th day, the entire area will be filled up. And also, it happens to be the same day this one-sixth of the room is ready to be harvested. So on the 112th day, you will clone 300 more clones, move them to the cloning rack, and then take your 210 best clones that were on the rack and move them to the pre-flowering table. We will then take the 210 that were on the pre-flowering table and place them here in the fruiting room, from the pre-flowering table to there. Two weeks later, you will do your cloning again and fill up this section of the fruiting room. Your room can be any size you wish, but these are the basic procedures you will follow. We will encourage you to use alternative designs when arranging the shape and size of your project. We realize not everyone has the same facilities as we do. This is the perpetuating cycle that you will follow. Your mamas will stay in this area 
indefinitely giving you 300 clones every two weeks. Every two weeks your clones will go from here to the pre-flowering table into one-sixth of the fruiting room and this will be your cycle that every two weeks after the 112th day you will follow. Every two weeks you will get one of the sections harvested. Now let's return to the work in progress. Once the clones have been put into the flowering room, we will want to give them a good fertilizing of this high nitrogen, full spectrum fertilizer. This fertilizer is water soluble. As you can see, it is a high nitrogen fertilizer. It is also a full spectrum fertilizer, which means it has a high abundance of secondary nutrients and trace elements. Simply place a measured amount into the water and if you have to add lime now would be a good time to do it. Simply put the lime into the water and mix. They together may be simply watered into the soil. Well since we are on a two-week cloning schedule two weeks must have passed. Cut, dip into the cloning gel, and then plant. This is our fourth cloning on our 42nd day of cloning. Besides cloning 300 clones today, we will move our second set of clones we did on our 14th day into the second one-sixth of the room. Each time a group of clones comes from the pre-flowering table and goes into the fruiting room, it will be time to fertilize them with the high nitrogen fertilizer. Whenever we want our plants to have vegetative growth, we give them the high nitrogen full spectrum fertilizer. Sometimes people have their favorite fertilizers they like to use. If you would like to experiment with different fertilizers or different ways of fertilizing, remember we are using what we call a man-made soil. Therefore, it will be absolutely necessary that we use a full spectrum fertilizer which has abundant secondary nutrients and trace elements. As for not all fertilizers do. And there we are, 300 more clones. There's a real nice one on the top there. Dip and plant. Now there we are, 300 more clones. And of course we will add some water making sure that we have our half inch of standing water. And there we are. Here we are with the clones we just did. Two weeks have passed and they are looking quite robust. And as you can see, they do well under these fluorescent lights. This is what your fruiting room should look like right now. You should have 630 clones in your room at this point. There is nothing wrong with your sound. A light meter is a helpful tool to have. So is this pH meter. This other pH meter measures pH at the bottom of the soil. If you were wondering why, 
half the racks were on wheels. This is why. The light rails above are positioned so that when the tables are next to each other, the lights are exactly centered on the tables. And there we are. Here we are doing our sixth cloning. Our mamas have reached the height of about four foot. They have the ability to each produce about 20 to 25 clones every two weeks, like this one here. Since we're doing our sixth cloning, this must be our 70th day of cloning. We will also fill up the fourth section of the fruiting room with the 10 to 12 inch clones from the pre-flowering table. Sometime within the first week of placing these into the fruiting room, they may receive their first fertilizing. The 10 to 12 inch clones do not start blooming the day they go into the fruiting room and start their 12 hour a day light period. They will continue to grow in the vegetative mode as they slowly develop the fruiting mode. However, the first clones put in the fruiting room have now been there for six weeks. You will notice about a week ago they started looking more and more like fruiting females. Sometime around the fifth or sixth week, they are in the fruiting room. I stop using the high nitrogen fertilizer and I start using the low nitrogen, high phosphorus fertilizer. The low nitrogen, high phosphorus, full spectrum fertilizer is best suited to blooming. Some people like to use a no nitrogen fertilizer once the upward growth of the plant has ceased and the plant is only budding. The sixth cloning is almost done. Remember the one half inch of standing water in the tray must be poured out every 48 hours and a fresh one half inch of water immediately poured into the tray to replace it. This ensures your clones will have a constant supply of fresh oxygenated water. And of course, every time we clone, there will be more advanced clones like these, which must come off the cloning table and be placed on the pre-flowering table over here. Sometimes to conserve space, clones coming from their two week stay on the cloning rack, which have been started in root cubes, may be transplanted into these small peat moss cups. Simply place a small amount of soil in the cup and gently seep the plant at the bottom. There we are. Then fill the remainder of the cup with soil. They are of course then placed on the pre-flowering table under 18 hour of 400 watt metal halide. I like to keep them in the peat cups for about a week, then transplant them to the six inch squares for the second week on the pre-flowering table before they go into the fruiting room. Here we are ready for our seventh cloning. These buds receive only a high phosphorus blooming type fertilizer. The exhaust fan you saw earlier is turned on from 6 a.m. to midnight so that the room will exhaust whenever the lights are on. In the winter time, when I must heat the room, I usually keep the fan on 24 hours a day. Remember, it is thermostatically controlled and has a variable speed. Now, the room is cooled with the air conditioner in front of me and exhaust out the fan in back of me. For pest control, two of our favorites are diatomaceous earth and sabadea. Sabadea is an organic soap wash. Your high nitrogen fertilizer is for vegetative growth. The high phosphorus fertilizer is for blooming buds. When the buds slow their upward growth and begin to bloom is the time I change from one type fertilizer to the other. This usually happens sometimes between the fourth and sixth week the plants are in the fruiting room. The blooming fertilizer is watered into the plants the same way the high nitrogen fertilizer is watered into them. And like the nitrogen fertilizer, if you need to do any pH adjustment, the lime or gypsum 
may be added to the fertilizing water, doing both jobs at once. And there we are. Remember when we started the seedlings? Once they reached the size of about 10 inches, before we cloned them, we gave them a spraying of Sebadia, even if we didn't see any bugs, purely as a preventive medicine kind of thing. Three weeks later, we gave them a light dusting with diatomaceous earth. Then three weeks later, the Sebadia. Then three weeks later, the diatomaceous earth, and so on. The mamas are the only ones I have found that ever need any other treatment. The clones are in transition and in the room such a short time that bugs never get a chance to get a foothold. I do not use the diatomaceous earth once the flowers have started to bloom. Keeping in mind alternative methods, if this roof was about a foot and a half taller, I could raise these tables these plants are on and keep a whole other set of clones under the table. After these plants on top received their 12 hour a day light, they could be switched with the ones under the table where they could receive their 12 hours of darkness. Then the ones you just put on top could get their 12 hours of daily light. That would double the output of this project and be using about the same space. You will notice the reflective material along the walls. Since the plants at the end of the light rails get the least light, the reflective material helps them receive a little more light. It only needs to go up the wall as high as the bottoms of the lights. I try to check the room when the lights go on at 6 a.m. each morning. I like to make sure the lights and rails are working properly. A quick check of the temperature, water, and overall status of the room can be made rather quickly. I look for any signs of bugs or rodents. Keeping all entrances sealed tightly and sealing all holes and cracks helps. You, you should make sure your air entrance and air exhaust are screened and closed when not in use. You must be careful not to get even a drop of cool water on the light bulbs when you are watering like this. They will explode, causing all sorts of problems. My light fixtures have protective glass covers on them. I try to visit the room at least once each evening around 6 p.m. when the lights in the fruiting room go off. This is a good time to make sure that your heating system is ready for the night if you are using an alternative heat source for the winter. I try to keep the room as clean as possible because of the possibility of mold and mildew in such a high humidity area. I paint all exposed wooden surfaces and cover any area that might get wet with thick rolls of plastic. This room holds a little over 2,000 clones. With this watering device and this hose, I can water this room in about 10 minutes. This project can be done in any size area. If you are using a closet, you'll want to stack the different sections of your area. You may use smaller bulbs for fruiting such as 150 watt metal halides or high pressure sodiums. This room produces about four pounds every two weeks. I have found that with some innovative double stacking, a 12 foot by 12 foot room will produce one and a half to two pounds every two to three weeks. I have known people to have this type of process in their attics, basements, garages, outbuildings, closets, buses. The possibilities are limited only by our imagination. Now, if I may change the subject just a moment, I would like to speak a little bit about conscience. They tell us that we are at war with ourselves, that we are fighting a drug war. Couldn't the government come up with another metaphor, one that would really express the true nature of what it is trying to say, like let's cure drug abuse in America? The obvious and the very best solution is a cure, not a punishment. If a person is doing a crime to himself, does it make more sense to punish him severely, to throw him in jail for years, thus ruining his life and another piece of society? Or does it make more sense to cure him? What is done to a person when he or she is arrested for marijuana is a crime. The severe punishment for marijuana does more bad to a person than marijuana ever will. To say it is okay to ruin someone's life so that marijuana won't hurt them is the height of stupidity. It's like cutting off your arm because you have a splinter in your finger. The law against marijuana is there supposedly because it is there to protect a person from doing harm to himself. 
If a person gets drunk and falls down and hurts himself, it happens every day, should we bust down his door, arrest him, and send him to jail for 20 years so he doesn't hurt himself again? Should we arrest everyone that damages their liver or kidneys drinking? Should we arrest them and give them long prison terms for the crime of hurting themselves? It is painfully obvious that the present laws and the present judicial solutions for dealing with marijuana are completely out of sync with reality. We have been conditioned to live and accept this injustice as part of life. Shame on us. It is in Neil Postman's recent book, Amusing Ourselves to Death, that he indicates it is not just the Orwellian externally imposed oppression that we must overcome. He warns us that, on the contrary, the most formidable foe we must overcome is Aldous Huxley's fear that we lose our autonomy and be reduced to passivity and egoism, becoming a trivial culture preoccupied with some equivalent of the feelies, the orgy-porgy, and the centrifugal bumble puppy. Is marijuana our bumble puppy? We must not come to the point where we avoid action for fear of difficulty or physical harm. We must at all costs remember that freedom is something that one must at all times keep a very careful eye upon. We in this case must not allow ourselves to become complacent. To do so would be to lose the little freedom that we have today. We need to do something that will help enlighten the American people as to the truth about marijuana. If everyone would do something, we all can't do it all, but we can each do something. If a lot of people phoned into television talk shows each day and communicated in a realistic fashion the facts about marijuana and requested, demanded, that the media responsible for the proper and truthful dissemination of public information started presenting finally the truth rather than the 50-year-old reefer madness crap which passes as fact today. If a large number of us phoned, wrote, faxed, etc., the major TV shows such as Nightline, 60 Minutes, Dateline, etc., the media just might begin to present the realistic facts concerning marijuana. The media is the best way we have to reach the majority of the American people. We can't wait for normal to collect enough money to buy the airtime it would take to present the entire case to the American public. We can, however, as individuals, bring a tremendous amount of attention to the media. I do not know how much normal actively pursues the media to allow them to present an intellectual and modern perspective to the American public. I do know, however, that if these media were receiving enough calls from all of us requesting just this sort of dialogue, they then just might decide there is enough public interest in the subject. A lot of people who smoke marijuana do this thing where they light up a joint at 4.20 p.m. each day. Now don't get me wrong, I think it's a fine thing and I have been known to light up more than once at this time myself. In fact, I think it is an excellent idea because it shows me that the American smokers can move together as one unit. Lighting up once every day at a certain time is great for binding us together in a conscious way. Let's carry it a step further. Let's phone the media once a week. You pick a day. Let everyone pick a different time. That way they will be getting calls 24 hours a day. Demand that they allow someone like Normal or some other pro-advocate to present an informative, realistic, truthful presentation of the facts. I am sure that if normal people saw a reasonable amount of other people pressing the various media, they would follow suit in an even more vigorous manner. The various media would most probably develop a real interest in the subject if they were to start receiving calls, letters, facts, etc. The media is always looking for an injustice to expose a wrong to make right. What better time than now? People, young fathers, young mothers in jail, families ripped apart, all because marijuana is misunderstood by most of the American public. How many more lives must be ruined before the public learns that marijuana is not the evil demon they have been led to believe it is? It is great to light up a joint every day at 420 and celebrate the freedom of being able to choose to smoke a joint. But remember, it is a hollow and empty freedom as long as marijuana is illegal. What I'm trying to say is that it is in everyone's best interest if the truth about marijuana could be brought to light. It is important to all of us on the planet that this happen as soon as possible not just for the smokers, but for everyone. If hemp could be legalized, many trees could be saved, farmers would have an alternative to bankruptcy, and America could get in on the ground floor of a rapidly growing international market of hemp. The money flowing out of this country on smoking marijuana would stay in this country, and the smokers of America could stop smoking poisoned, paraquat-sprayed marijuana. I could go on forever. I think, however, the better form would be in the media. So let's give it a try. Let's each and every one of us phone up one of the various media at least once a week and demand the truth be told. We owe it to ourselves to maintain our freedom and for some to be set free. So remember, 
at 240, pick up your phone. At 420, light up and pat yourself on the back and know we are each and every one of us part of a larger whole which has the ability to make a change happen. Remember what our brother Bob Marley said, get up, stand up, don't give up the fight. We did our seventh cloning, the 84th day of cloning, while I was talking. We are now on the eighth cloning, the 98th day of cloning. After this cloning, the entire fruiting room will be filled. This is a major milestone in your room because what this means is that in two more weeks, we will have the first of a continuously endless self-perpetuating harvest. Once this happens, you will harvest one-sixth of your room every 14 days. You will clone 300 clones every 14 days. You will move 210 clones to the cloning rack every 14 days. You will move 210 plants into the fruiting room every 14 days to fill the space vacated by the area which will be harvested once every two weeks. Trim that one just a little bit. Dip. Add a bunch of nice cloning gel onto the stem into our pre-punched hole. Here you can easily see the one half inch of standing water. And even though these clones are in soil, it's almost like they're in a hydroponic solution because they're sitting in this one half inch of water. These clones have the exact genetic makeup that the parents we're cloning them from have. Another nice clone from the top. You'll notice how large our mamas have grown and what really nice clones, such as this one being planted, we're getting from them. We'll take one more clone, a little one from the top, dip it into our cloning gel, into the pre-punched hole, and into the soil water. And there we are, 300 more clones. After each cloning, the previous two weeks worth of clones must be transferred to the pre-flowering table. These clones here have been growing on the pre-flowering table very nicely during the last two weeks. Given the proper environmental conditions, they are quite easy to root. If at all possible, I like to have a clean or different razor blade to clone each plant with. This way you won't pass any unwelcome germs from one plant to the other. It is important that you change the half inch of standing water each 48 hours. I have also found that after a week, clones in soil and peat moss cups don't need the half inch of standing water and that if you just keep them wet, it is sufficient. Some people like to give their clones 24 hour a day grow light. I find that they do just as well with the 18 hour a day light. Of course, feel free to experiment with the differences if you wish. In the winter time, you must take special care not to let your clones get cold. A couple of thermometers in the bottoms of the trays will help you to keep an eye on that. In the winter time, if you place your clones near the roof, they will be much easier to keep warm. Don't these clones look nice? This is what your clones should look like just prior to leaving the pre-flowering table to go into the flowering room. I call them plants rather than clones at this point. The plants should be anywhere from 10 to 12 inches in height. You should be able to see fresh new growth starting to sprout from the upper nodes, if not all of the nodes. If you see any yellowing of the lower food leaves, this probably means they are ready to be fertilized. Try a half strength dosage of fertilizer the first time. This is what your room should look like at this time.
there is nothing wrong with your sound. The seed, the seed, the seed. We have taken you from the seed to these beautiful, mature plants. We have shown you how to plant and germinate your seeds. We showed you our special process for determining the sex of your seedlings. We showed you how to develop your seedlings into nice, bushy mamas. We have explained the process of making clones, exact little genetic replicas of their parents. We have explained their journey from the cloning rack to the pre-flowering table and into the flowering room. We have explained the requirements of the plants as they entered the flowering room. We have shown you the transition that the plants go through as they go from the vegetative state to the flowering state. We have tried to show you as many of the requirements that the plant must have in order for them to make that particular transition. We hope we have done our job. We have found that if you will follow these simple instructions, you will soon begin your harvest. You will find that like clockwork, once every two weeks, your harvest rolls in indefinitely, like a virtual sea of green, wave after continuous wave, a self-perpetuating endless supply of homegrown herb. Well. The next step is going to be to harvest. And here we are harvesting some of these nice, beautiful ladies. On the other side of this blue laundry basket, ooh, that's a nice one. On the other side of this blue laundry basket is about 200 clones, which will be harvested today. And then the area vacated by them will be filled up by 210. There's a nice one too clones from the pre-flowering table. Further into the trailer, about six foot down, will be another 210, which will be harvested two weeks from now. And that area, ooh, there's a nice one. That area will again also be filled up with 210 clones from the pre-flowering table, etc. What you want to do now is look at all of your clones. This one's a little sparse. Because all of our seedlings, which created the mama plants, are not all the same. There's a nice one. What you'll find is that some mamas produce much, much better plants than others do. So what you'll want to do is go through all of your clones after your first harvest. There's a real nice one there. Find out the plants, which are your smelliest, beefiest, nicest buds ones that have small distances between their nodes and have just given you really nice buds. Find out which mamas they came from. Then take your very best one or two mamas that gave you your very best clones 
clone those mamas and make you some clones from them and keep them separate. Raise them up, and when they get to the point, to the size, that you can start getting 15, 20, 25 clones from them, there's a nice one there, then replace your other mamas that aren't doing so well with the mamas that you created from your very best mama. Now there's a nice one right there. These buds smell so sweet and so nice. That one was a little sparse. Your first harvest, you will have clones of slightly different variation. We'll have to find out which one that came from. But after a while, when you've done your seven, second harvest, and you've created just clones of your very best of your best, then you will find that your harvest will be more uniform. I usually get about 10 to 14 grams per bud on my second harvest. On your first harvest, you can expect to get somewhere around eight grams average per bud, and that's dry weight. That one's a little sparse too. I don't think we'll be saving the mama that that one came from. These buds are thick and dense and quite weighty. Even the small ones will give us a nice harvest. We will continue to cut these. Now there's a real nice one there. We'll find out where it mamas came from. We'll continue to cut these until we have only the 210 which are supposed to be cut. Here we are in the drying room. Curing is an important part of our process. We like to hang our plants upside down we allow the large leaves to eventually droop over the buds, and this helps them to dry at a more proper rate. The windows have been sealed so that people don't look in, and so that we can keep light out of the room. Marijuana does not like light while it is drying. Because of the humidity in the air which these plants produce, we like to put a fan either in a door or a window, and help exhaust the humidity out of the room. It is a good idea, however, not to put the fan directly on the plant.